Uh, All right, so this is the first episode of the Skyler Sense podcast. Today we have my dad, Peter Skyler, uh, and I was just going to basically ask about uh, his experiences. He was a New Jersey state champ. Uh, what year was that? 1977. 1977. Um, then he wrestled at Lehigh. Um, well, actually, you want to tell talk about how Dave Burley, what's his name? Daryl Burley. Daryl Burley. Um, and like how you wrestled him at states and then ended yes. up going to Lehigh. So yes. I'll share about that. Okay. What was the ex- experience? Well, I was a state champ my junior year. Okay. Daryl was a weight below me, and he was third against a, a, a guy who was a returning state champ. And then we met in the finals of our senior year, and he beat me in the finals. And uh, but we both ended up uh, looking at Lehigh, and uh, we both ended up going there. And it was a um, it was a great experience because I had a guy in the room every day that was tough as nails that uh, helped you get better. And he ended up being a four time NCAA finalist and two time champ. And I ended up uh, not doing quite as well, but I. Won two Eastern titles and uh, placed uh, third my senior year at the NCAA. Okay. And when did you originally meet him? Uh, I actually beat him my junior year in high school in a summer tournament. Okay. And uh, he had been third in the state and I was the defending champ. And then we met the following year at the, at the same weight. And uh, he beat me 7-5 to five in the finals. We both went to the high school nationals. I ended up, we both were all Americans there. He ended up in the finals against Andre Metzger, um, who was a two time NCAA champ, and he got beat. But he was just getting a feel for freestyle. Mm-hmm. I ended up placing sixth that year, and then we both uh, matriculated to Lehigh. When did you start wrestling freestyle? Like, what was like? Uh, about my sophomore year in high school. How much do you think that helped you in folk style? Uh, a great deal. It was just more wrestling, and it was a, it was a different style, but uh, it was basically year-round wrestling. Um, you got done with the regular collegiate season or the scholastic season, and I used to go to a club, a um, couple of places, um, where I would work out with guys that uh, um, were very good in some cases, uh, college guys. I used to take a train to the New York Athletic Club. I lived in New Jersey, and I took a train, and there were guys there that were college guys as well as guys that had retired from wrestling but worked in the city and and still came over to the club to to work out. So uh, met some really good wrestlers and, and again, improved. When you say club, do you mean like wrestling mat club, not like club as in drinking and partying? Uh, the New York Athletic Club is a building in New York City, and it, it, it used it's used primarily by people that work in the city, executives that at lunchtime or even after work come there to either play racquetball to um, what else do they have their basketball and they have a wrestling room. They also sponsor wrestlers, uh, guys that after they graduate from college. Uh, at international tournaments or uh, freestyle tournaments, and I got sponsored by the New York Athletic Club, so it enabled me to to do a lot of wrestling um, after I graduated from college when I was coaching. So that was kind of a neat experience as well. How'd they sponsor you? Like, how'd that come about? Um, well, I I done well, and and then uh, typically what they would do to they would have tournaments also, the mm-hmm. Christmas tournament and the spring tournament, and if you did well there then they wanted you to wrestle for them uh, at the National Freestyle Championships. And so they had uh, college wrestlers and, and, and some guys, guys that were past college that were still competing, and they would sponsor them um, at the international uh, events if you made a, a World Cup or a, or, or a, a team, uh, or, but also um, would sponsor you to go to pay for your ticket and pay for your hotel and meals while you, when you competed in a, in a national freestyle tournament or in the World Cup or whatever event you were, you were competing in. And so the one accomplishment that you got 
third in the World Cup was or fourth. No, no. Well, I and that wasn't real impressive. It was the World Cup is not the World Championships. I did have a couple of wins there, um, and uh, but it did give me a chance to wrestle some really spectacular guys, um, Olympic and World Champions. Um, and uh, uh, so, how does that even work? Because I personally don't even know. Like, I don't even understand. You, it was, uh, I was, it was a couple of years after I graduated from college and I was competing and uh, I got invited to try out for the World Cup team and I wrestled off for it. It was not an Olympic year, so the, the weight class wasn't nearly as deep as it would be in an Olympic year. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, I made the team, the World Cup team, and wrestled in it, mm -hmm. which was kind of a thrill just, just doing that uh, in and of itself. So... And so, who did you end up wrestling to get, and like, who did you end up losing to to get uh, fourth? Like, what was like? Uh, I wrestled the Russian, who was Victor Alexiev, who was an Olympic champion. Uh, I lost to uh, the Jap. Uh, I forget his name, but he was when the when they boycotted. He had uh, what was he? He was a silver medalist, I think. Um, who else? The the guys that I wrestled. Uh, uh, was Gary Bohey um, from Canada? Uh, who else? The guy I'm trying to remember. Uh, I think there were four or five guys that I wrestled. Um, you know, and it was a good experience. Was their wrestling style different from like the U.S.? Well, it was freestyle. Yeah, it was freestyle. Everybody was like wrestling. I've heard, I've heard the United States people. is unique in that it has a, a collegiate style, mm -hmm. whereas most other countries have a their colleges wrestle. Freestyle and as a college style, mm -hmm. and ours is different. So, but I think it's I think it's neat to have those two two styles, and they're not that far apart. They're it's, it, competing on your feet, getting the takedown. The top and bottom position is is different. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, the guy on the bottom in freestyle is just trying to avoid being turned, and uh, guy on the bottom in collegiate style is obviously trying to get an escape or reversal, and the guy on top in freestyle is just trying to work in a very short period of time to get, get an exposure for this guy on top is college style is really trying to ride the guy get a you know control of him mm -hmm. also trying to turn him but really trying to control him from uh, preventing him from escaping and, and, and accumulating riding time which you get points for yeah well because I heard that some people um, their experience is wrestling like other uh, countries like it was like it was almost a different style of wrestling like just they felt different than the normal u.s people like wrestlers well like, did I, they feel like super superior on some well it's interesting you say that because it the u.s has come a long way i know um at least when i was in college and a couple of years after the 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 russians dominated the international competitions the world and olympic competitions mm -hmm. however the most recent world championships the u.s had more champs than anybody from what i from what i just read mm -hmm. and and i think more guys are staying in it a little longer and doing it and uh and they're competing well against the, the what traditionally had always been uh dominated by the by the russians mm -hmm. used to be the soviets now it's the russians yeah and and there's also uh, countries that are you wouldn't think are special but they have one of their sports as their national sport is the, the Islamic Republic of Iran that's a very uh, they're very good wrestlers over there um, you know and, and it's interesting different European countries Eastern European countries for whatever reason have very strong wrestling histories Bulgaria Romania a, a lot of the, the, the former Iron Curtain countries were all very good in wrestling mm -hmm. and still are very good in wrestling when did you start like getting serious about wrestling i guess when i was in high school when did you start originally just wrestling like even be like uh sixth grade I, we had a little clinic at our school and i wrestled in that and i had one match with with a with a guy where they kept score and he was later my teammate best friend in high school Who is and it? then pat gleason okay and uh, he wrestled all through high school and into college as well wrestled at rutgers um 
And then seventh grade, I uh, again, I had five dual meets and I won the, the local tournament. And that was, uh, and then I, there was an AAU tournament afterwards. And um, I had some success there. And so I, I probably got hooked that, at that point. Mm -hmm. But I really didn't decide to really immerse myself probably until my after my freshman year in high school. What do you think about kids getting into wrestling at such like young ages and like do you think that's a good thing or do you think it's like just per, like essentially leads to burnout? I think kids starting very young can be um, can be detrimental because most of the time when kids begin wrestling at a very young age, elementary school, for example. Mm -hmm. It's the parents that are um, allowing them to compete in various tournaments and competitions. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I felt very lucky in that my, um, when I first started wrestling, I think prior to that, uh, I was in trouble a lot, getting in all kinds of uh, trouble with school and, and things that I was doing and wrestling was a positive uh, mm -hmm. uh, change for that and so my folks were excited that I was wrestling but they they did not they were not involved at all mm -hmm. um, so I, I, uh, I so was I, that I, a good thing? for me it was because I didn't feel any pressure mm -hmm. if I was going to go to a tournament even in high school before I got my driver's license, I'd hitch a ride with another family that was going. Um, and, uh, you know, my folks my folks would come to the in-season competitions, not all of them, but most of them. And then out of season, that was all mine. Uh, sometimes they didn't even know I was going. And then, what do you got going tomorrow? And are we going to do the lawn or do that? And I said, no, I'm, I'm going to hitch a ride with the Gleasons and go to a wrestling tournament. And they're like, okay. Uh, but it was mine, and and the way, the reason I think that was good for me is that I was deciding. I, I, my folks weren't deciding, mm -hmm. and I was doing it because I enjoyed it and it was motivating for me. So I, you know, and, and if I did take a break, my folks didn't even know I was doing stuff that they were, you know, they were aware if I went to the YMCA to work out or with a. Uh, as I got later in high school, I used to take a train to the New York Athletic Club, mm -hmm. and I kind of did that on my own, and, and uh, uh, that way I got to wrestle with some good college wrestlers and some older guys that had graduated that were working in the city, and it was a good experience that way, too. Talk about the experience of going to the New York Athletic Club, because I thought it was crazy that you always came back at, like, super late, and you're coming through the train just to come back to Bound Brook in New Jersey. So like, what was like the exact, like? Tuesday and Thursdays were the workouts. Okay. So Tuesday and Thursday nights from seven to nine. So like, and, you come uh, home So I'd come home, I'd, I'd, and, and I wouldn't go during the wrestling season, but after the wrestling season, I would Tuesday and Thursday nights. I'd, I'd, uh, and at the time, um, you needed to go in through the front. I didn't realize you could go in through the back way, but you had to wear a, a, a tie, a, a coat and a tie. Mm -hmm. and so I'd bring that with me on the train and I'd take a train to uh, Penn Station, Newark and then take the, uh, a train from there to Penn Station, New York and I'd walk from, you know, uh, uh, 34th to, uh, uh, what was it, 59th Street uh, on 8th, 7th or 8th Avenue and that's where the New York Athletic Club was. Mm -hmm. And then I'd take a train, like a subway on the way back because it was getting late. And uh, I did that. I did it also when I was... Uh, junior and senior summers when I was working and that was crazy because I wouldn't get back till late and then I got to get up uh, my senior year I had to get up in the early morning to work a construction job with a with the outfit and uh, so I on Tuesday and Thursday nights I didn't get a lot of sleep mm -hmm. but it was I wanted to work out and work out with guys do you think that was beneficial Even yeah like the whole well more so than yeah working out yeah but also Kind of figuring out, hey, this is, that was my life. I wasn't, you know, that was, I didn't have any, I didn't hang out with friends afterwards or anything like that. I was, I was trying to get better, you know, I was trying to get better and that meant traveling a bit on my own. And again, my folks, 
uh, I, I remember the first couple of times I did it, I, I asked my dad, who had for years had worked in New York City, uh, how do I get to New York Athletic Club? It's on 7th Avenue, 59th Street. And he said, sure, take the train from Boundbrook to Penn Station North, go downstairs, get down. Uh, they got a train called the Path, or they got a regular train that goes on a regular basis to, um, you know, uh, New York and uh, uh, Grand Central Station, or, uh, yeah, was it Grand Central? Or it was uh, just right underneath the, um, uh, well, I can't believe I'm drawing a blank on it, but anyway, the main station in, in, in New York, and mm -hmm. he, that was on, on 7th Avenue. Go up the stairs, two flights, get a subway, find where the subway is, 7th Avenue subway, head uptown from 34th all the way to 59th Street, get out there, go to the New York Athletic Club, get changed in my wrestling gear, go up, warm up, work out with these guys that were, you know, real good wrestlers, or some of them were very good to me in, in helping me, um, technique. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a couple of guys, there was a guy named, uh, a Japanese guy, and he eventually ended up uh, coaching at Penn State for many years, but he was a national champ. He came over here from Japan and, and also won the freestyle or Greco nationals, I guess it was, Hashiro Oishi. And uh, he would work out with me a lot. And then mm -hmm. there was a guy, uh, Hamid Kerman Shah, who, who was an Iranian uh, that owned a car carpet store in New York City. He used to go there and work out. And then there were other guys from college and, and older guys that were, um, graduated from college and would work out and they'd all have little tips. Okay, you're getting scored on here doing this. Mm -hmm. You gotta drop this leg or drop. And it was very helpful. They were all very, usually very good. Mm -hmm. And and as, as a result, I went and went to those tournaments as well. Um, I went to tournaments in uh, um, high school and college. Okay. Matt, can you please turn that down? Thank you. Um, so next, uh, your experiences in cross country during like that time, like it's like when did you start cross country? We, well, there was he had summer workouts for us, but I was doing a lot of wrestling. I was fit, you know, and I did a lot of fair amount of running, mm -hmm. um, but I didn't do. Uh, we were what were we averaging six miles a day running, and uh, you know sometimes we'd go for longer runs and. Obviously, sometimes a shorter one, but we had a real good cross country team. We were the four years I were there, we were undefeated in cross country. Um, uh, we had we had some very good runners, guys that uh, we had a guy my sophomore year who was the, I believe he was a captain. He's actually a four star general now at West Point. He ran cross country for West Point, really? but the Trombador brothers, uh, who were all very good students and. One went to Navy, one went to Stanford, one went to Princeton. Um, so it was with a, it was a crew that were hard workers and very bright, uh, uh, bright guys. But uh, yeah, we had a. Would you a wrestle one year, afterwards? What's that? Would you wrestle after practice? Uh, cross country, I did sometimes with Dave Trombador. I was very close to Dave Trombador. He was a year ahead of me. Okay. Um, and yes, uh, we would. We would roll out a mat uh, often after cross country practice. Uh, and just do a little bit of drilling. And so he was very good that way. You had to roll it out? It wasn't just like out Well, there wasn't, the wrestling room, our wrestling room was not a year-round wrestling room. Mm -hmm. It was a health classroom. And when, even during the wrestling season, first we get done with school, you have one guy sliding the chairs to the other guy out the door and they, they would slide along the floor and you'd slide all the chairs out and mm -hmm. the other two guys or three or four guys would roll out two sections of math that fit perfectly in that room. Mm -hmm. Two sections and then in the back room, same thing, throw out the chairs or slide them out the door, roll out the mats and at the end of practice every day, roll up the mats, slide the chairs back in for the classroom. Okay. We didn't have a... a, a year-round wrestling. Was, how, how do you think cross-country helped you with wrestling? We were all in shape. We were in great shape coming into the season. We're a very low percentage of body fat and mm -hmm. so we weren't we were cutting weight but there wasn't anybody that was like cutting at least on cross-country that was cutting weight um, and losing because they were already a low percentage of body fat. We, we were, what were your experiences with like at that point in time? So like what what year was that again? Like I ran 
on the varsity cross country team, sophomore, junior, and senior year. And that's like 19. That was 19. Uh, 78 was my senior year, so 77, 76 cross country. Um, it was actually the you know the school year split in two, mm -hmm. uh, and and it's an earlier part of that. So 77 was 77, 78 was my senior year. So 77, 76, 75, 74 were all years I ran cross country. I ran on the freshman team. What were the experiences of like people cutting weight? Like what was that like? Did you see people like cut crazy weight? Like I did. Like, I did it very foolishly. Still... My my freshman year, I had an undefeated season, but I didn't. Um, you know, I, I uh, it, it didn't shine as bright as I thought. It was. I, I was undefeated in dual meets, and I ended up second in the districts. But I cut too much weight. I, I kind of grew out of the weight class. Mm -hmm. And I was still young and inexperienced at really cutting weight. So I did it poorly. Um, what I were did, the things that you did? Uh, well, I, 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 I binge. We'd go to, after the meet, we'd go to a diner and everything, and you'd stuff yourself. Mm -hmm. So you were so bloated. When you, you know you really need to do that, yeah. but you would cut some weight. You were watching what you're eating, and 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 you and you starve a little bit, and right right up to the weigh in, and then you you eat too much, and you you'd feel bloated, and even after the meat, instead of just stopping, you know, you'd be like, oh, let's go there, let's go somewhere else and have something to eat, mm -hmm. and that was a bad thing, and I probably got it under control best my junior year, sophomore year I was not cutting that much weight I, I I you know I was wrestling near about what what I was when I came out of cross country uh but freshman year I really struggled with the weight cut because mm -hmm. I think even today there's still people that are cutting in the most too much poor ways yeah 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 well and in my junior and senior year I didn't cut I didn't really cut a lot of weight um and I was I was in really good shape and I didn't I wrestled 129 Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I was going to go up to 135, but I was weighing out of practice, you know, very close to 129. I just said, went on, just stay at 129. So that's what I did. Because mm -hmm. in in school, we learned that it's like you should really only be cutting one to two pounds at most. Like, and that's like, like if you're cutting two pounds, that's like supposedly like you should have a lot of body fat on you in the first place. But they say that you should only like the most you should be cutting a week. Is one to two pounds and it's like well when you say cutting wrestling. like going into the wrestling room you'd always lose a little weight after mm -hmm. practice like like but i think that's probably a good a rule of thumb unless you're carrying more than about i don't know um you're carrying more than maybe eight percent body fat yeah and even that's like i think a lot of people because like well i just got my uh body fat checked what do you mean well on my stomach, that was the lowest. That was four percent. On my triceps, there was like ten percent. On my, and I think there was some. I think it was eight percent. What was overall? What was the overall percentage? I don't even know. They just. Uh, so they just tested so, certain well, areas. Well, they probably knew. Yeah, they tested the certain uh, triceps. So it sounds like you were uh, probably like, but somewhere between five and ten percent, right? Probably. probably. Which is, and you're pretty lean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so like, no, that's a good way to. That's a good. Yeah, and, and as I said, see, here's where it's different. Some guys feel comfortable at like 4% body fat, mm -hmm. and they walk around during the day. Other guys think they're dying at 8% body fat. Mm -hmm. And some guys are naturally carry more weight, but have a higher percentage body fat and can tolerate uh, or, 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 you know, have that, whereas other guys that are very lean don't notice it, just are naturally very thin. Mm -hmm. And have a high, uh, what do you call it? Uh, um, body fat. Well, they have a they have a low percentage of body fat, body and they burn burn off fuel very easily. Mm -hmm. Burn off their their the food very is, easily. Like, again, what I'm learning is like the more muscle you have, it's like so much like you just burn, you, like your resting metabolic rate is so much higher. If you're just like if you have more muscle, it's like that's is. And then if you don't have that much fat, like you just have muscle, you're like, losing muscle when you cut weight. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, but it's, it's just crazy because I still feel like there's so many kids that even at just my wrestling team, like I feel like all of like like even like I might not even be doing it. Like when I was going down to one twenty five, I don't think it was. I feel like I was losing too much there, 
and everyone's like, oh, that's not even cutting or whatever. And I feel like it's such a yeah, stigma. Yeah, I think you're right. Is... More people should. Well, the yeah. other thing that you, you want is a mental aspect. If you're cutting a lot of weight, it's not much fun. Mm -hmm. No one likes to starve themselves. Or, and uh, But if you're, so long as you're not a, you know, stuffing yourself and you have a large big belly or whatever, <laughs> if you're training and you're in very good shape uh, and you're able to go long periods, uh, you know, wrestling or running and, and uh, you have great conditioning, chances are you're probably at a low percentage of body fat. Mm -hmm. and, and, and even if you're not at a low percent, if you're in, if you're in tip top shape and you're, you can last a long time and you, you've got great endurance, maybe that percentage of body fat isn't bad for you. Mm -hmm. you, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and, and like I said, if you see, you and, and there's lots of guys, very good wrestlers on both, st both ways, that one guy, you can see every muscle in his body because he's so cut and lean. Mm -hmm. Another guy, champion, NCAA champion or uh, high school champion, he's carrying a little extra, but he manages it very well because mm -hmm. he's in great shape and he's, his, his metabolism is not as fast. That's what I was earlier talking about. Mm -hmm. Some people have a very slow metabolism where they put on a little weight and it just, it burns off really slow. Other people eat something, they burn it right off and they're lean as ever. Mm -hmm. you, you know what I mean? Yeah. Just naturally. Um, you kind of have a fast metabolism, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, so anyway, I think a lot of it is gonna cater to whatever uh, you're comfortable with and your body style, your body type. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, what do you think about uh, body types in wrestling? Like, that's like, what I love about the sport. That's well, that's one thing that I like. It was either for me, it was either running or wrestling. I was already better at running than I was at wrestling. I had no accomplishments with wrestling, but it was like you only can get to a certain point in running. It's also like genetic, like in as well as in other sports, but like body types matter so much. It's much crazy. More. Well, no, like, well, the more we're running. running. Yeah, the, yeah. Like, if you want to be a, a, a runner, you got to have long legs and a short torso. Well, lean. you got to be lean. Yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, and you can't, yeah, you can't whereas, have stumpy legs. Whereas yeah. in, in swimming, you, like, I feel like you need more of uh, a longer uh, torso, right. like yes. a longer torso and uh, like a smaller, smaller legs, I guess, just so you're less weight or whatever. But like just anyways, there's like basketball, no, there's typical, volleyball, yes, you, have yeah. to, you have to be this certain height to be good. And it's like you can get somewhere um, not being the same body type, but I feel like wrestling, there's advantages to both. Absolutely. You see some, you see some different styles, and I'll just focus on the NCAA championships. And I could probably pick out over a course of five years some guys that are incredibly long and lean uh, that are ex NCAA champions that use the, their body type to their advantage that, you know, uh, um, and, and then there's other guys that look like little compact fire plugs that are also very good and, and are national champions and use their body type in a, in a way that, that fits their um, style. And is, and is effective at scoring and at uh, um, winning in that sport. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you see all types. I'll tell you, they also sometimes, um, you know, there was a, a, a good example I always thought was uh, the Schultz brothers. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar way back when uh, Mark and Dave Schultz, they were stars when I was in college. And uh, okay. um, Mark, um, was very built, you know, broad shoulders, mm -hmm. very um, muscular, uh, narrower hips and a V and very um, powerful wrestler. And Dave Schultz, who was actually the better of the two, mm -hmm. he kind of had a funny looking shape. He had, he had a, kind of a bigger butt and uh, kind of a sway back a little bit and didn't really have a real... Uh, v and his and yet he was phenomenal. He was an incredible technician. He was very strong still, but he just didn't he didn't look like a bodybuilder, whereas his brother did. 
Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and yet they both were very, very effective mm -hmm. and, and very good. Um, I think technique, uh, I, I think there's so many variables there that are important. Um, uh, you know, the athletic skills, speed, balance, mm -hmm. those, are, those are important. Uh, strength, you know, natural strength. Um, um, the other part of it is technique, a guy who is an incredibly... Uh, good technician who's who is can score in many different ways from many different positions, mm -hmm. and and is and is very talented. Um, you know the guy that just has an incredible um, conditioning that can just outlast uh, mm -hmm. the guy because he just has a natural level just of different conditioning. Different styles of people wrestling. Some people are just super good at technique and they have no. Uh, gas tank and but they can still win but then some people are the other way like yes yeah. well and, I, and that's degrees it's you know everybody's got a pretty good gas tank usually mm -hmm. they're, they're good but also balance and and uh, uh, another Not example is someone that uses their hips very well has mm -hmm. tremendous ability to use their hips and and in, in different techniques um, well, so there's a lot of variables which makes wrestling kind of neat because you have a guy that's um, like I, like you said, different a short, fire plug looking guy that mm -hmm. can win. Another tall, long, lanky guy. Um, you know, a guy that's maybe not tremendously strong, but is technically very sound. And um, there's a lot of variables in which a guy can um, have great success, which is kind of neat. It's kind of a, I think, a special sport. The other thing is, unlike other sports, you get guys that are tiny. To big and they all have a weight class they can compete in and uh, which it makes it a sport for everybody mm -hmm. you know it's not just well you know, you know the only guy's gonna play on the line for a professional football team or you know guys 6 2 and maybe two over 225 230 otherwise you're not gonna play on the line mm -hmm. or, or you know you need big guys or a guy that's gonna be on the basketball team not all of them have to be over six foot but Mm -hmm. Look at the NBA. Aren't how many Spud webs are there? Very few. Yeah. You know, there's there's a few, but there's very few. And wrestling, you got all types, mm -hmm. which is is kind of a neat neat sport. What do you think about uh, the best ways to learn? Like those different little things, like we we're talking about, like hip awareness, um, just like mat awareness, um, technique. Like, do you think like I know we have this conversation all the time with me and Malcolm. And we talked about it a little bit before, but like, do you think technique is the best way to learn? Um, like, I guess just how to do a move. Do you think play wrestle is the best way to do it? Do you think live is the best way to learn? Like hip awareness. I I think, um, I think generally speaking, in different positions, a guy's one a guy's got to have several takedowns which he can score on just about anybody. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't mean he can know every, uh, be able to score and uh, with 20 different techniques on, on, on their feet, whether it be from ankle picks to chest to chest ties to double to single legs, high crotches. Maybe he's gotta have three that he can score on just about anybody. And the way that happens is he's drilled them where he doesn't, he doesn't even have to think about them. He just, he, he gets into a position where he's in a position to penetrate and score, and he penetrates and scores, and he doesn't even think about it, it just happens. And that happens because a guy does it repetitively over and over and over and over and over again. And sometimes he's got to tweak it. Sometimes mm -hmm. he does it, and all of a sudden he gets his arm caught on a double because he's not keeping his elbows in. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, he's maybe not, maybe not dropping his hips when he's doing an ankle pick as well. And, 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 and so, but once he refines that technique to where he's able to do it in a very, very uh, disciplined way that is, that is near perfect, most of the time that's gonna, that guy's gonna be able to score on just about anybody he wrestles. And, 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 and if he can have one or two of those te techniques, um, generally speaking, that's gonna be a winning takedown for him. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes a guy will shut him down if he can't get an underhook and he can't so he's going to have to find a new way to lower his levels to get in to pick a guy but but he also 
the nice thing about those several takedowns, having two or three, is that sometimes one can lead into another. Mm -hmm. Like a guy will counter one and he'll come back and hit another one. It feeds off of that first technique. Yeah, James. Um, yeah, and, and uh, but a guy's got a, most guys, most really good guys don't have five or six techniques that they're doing. Mm -hmm. Most of them have a handful of techniques, maybe two or three, sometimes a little bit more, but you know, you, you look at the great guys that won Olympic titles and, you know, and, and they have signature moves that they're really good at. Mm -hmm. John Smith with a low single. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, back in my day, there was a guy named Butch Keezer, Lloyd Keezer. He was an ankle pick guy. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what his technique was. Yeah. And he found different ways to get it. Tech, to get it. Maybe he shot into a single, then fed into an ankle pick. Ankle pick. Mm -hmm. And in Smith's case, he had other things that he did. He had a beautiful high crotch, too. And But... Uh, his low single was his his go to move. Yeah. You know, and and and, and that is something that uh, someone is starting to wrestle that they need to start with one or two techniques and drill them over and over, and then be able to use them from a good stance and actually get them in live competition, mm -hmm. maybe at a low level when they first start, you know, and then eventually gradually maybe feeding those same techniques with a little different setup here and there, but still doing the basic technique. Say it's a double leg, mm -hmm. where they're penetrating in, they're lowering their levels, they're, they're going in on the guy's knees, and maybe they're driving across to finish a takedown. And that basic technique is the double leg, but then maybe they're different, using different setups, whether they're banging the head, whether they're going into a drag into it, or maybe they're taking a single leg, that guy's brawls come back, snap down into a double leg, and it's feeding off of the first shot. Mm -hmm. But that that um, that's how a guy first starts to get good at a takedown. And then maybe he feeds from there into another takedown. But he, he does generally need to have two or three go-to takedowns, mm -hmm. you know, that, uh, that he can score on. <clears throat> so after you win, like after... Uh High school, you went with Daryl Burley, you went to Lehigh. Um, what were your experiences like at Lehigh and like how much did that teach you going, like coming out of college, like? Coming um, out or going in? Well, I guess going in and like, but the whole process of like college. Well, like, going in to work out at Lehigh, we had, it was a tremendous room because we had uh, uh, obviously Daryl and myself. Daryl was, was his freshman year; he's a national champ. Mm -hmm. And and going with him at practice, he was awful hard to score on. Mm -hmm. And and so it made you get very good at at being very particular in how you score on him. But I, and I didn't just go with him. We had the guys that were coaching there as grad assistants were very good guys who I go and a lot of them were my size. Mm -hmm. It was Mike Frick who was a two-time NCAA champ. It was Lance Lenhart who was a two-time Eastern champ. It was Bobby Sloan who was a Eastern champ and All-American. And those were all guys that had since graduated uh, maybe uh, five years before and, and they were all around my size. Mm -hmm. So I going with, there was no shortage of guys in the room that were tougher than hell that you had to keep a, a good positive outlook because those guys were hard to score on, mm -hmm. but that you learned how to, how to go with really, really tough guys. That and my teammates, the teammates that I had were Tommy Houston, who was a two-time Eastern champ, Daryl Burley, who I mentioned was a four-time NCAA finalist, mm -hmm. um, Richie Santoro, he was a, a two-time All-American uh, and Eastern champion. Um, who else do, that I'm trying to think that I go went uh, often with um, was, uh, um, I guess, Houston, Santoro, Burley, uh, and then other upper weights. Tom Bold was very good. He was a, um, a couple-time NCAA qualifier, Pennsylvania State champ out of high school. He was awful tough. Um, uh, and then, of course, the guys that had graduated that, were there as grad assistants. As I mentioned, mm -hmm. Bobby Sloan, Lance Lenhart, uh, Tom Scully, he was another one. He was a national champ. Um, he was a 134 pound national champ. He was bigger when he was in college, mm -hmm. but he was there one year as a grad assistant. So we had grad assistants that were all around my weight that are super tough. 
Lance, Bobby Sloan, um, uh, Tom Scully, Mike Frick. Um, I mean, there's were four studs right there that were part of our, you know, workout group. So wrestling. Steve Bascinelli was another guy that was a uh, Eastern champ that uh, um, a very tough guy. Um, mm -hmm. So it was it was a it was a loaded room. Wrestling those guys, and if you lost uh, in a practice, uh, like what was your mentality afterwards? Like after losing like a hard practice and like getting beat up, like you get what, I, especially was, with Daryl. I'd be frustrated as heck. Because he was so hard to score on. What was your mentality to, like, continue to be... Well, and then you'd have every other day or, you know, every couple of days, you'd have a day where you just, like, I just took that guy down. I'm fired up. Like, you know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm clicking. The pistons are going. I'm, I'm on. There's and something. then the next day, I'd be get, come in and get beat up and be mm -hmm. like, oh, man, that was... <laughs> so it was up and down. Yeah. But, but it was good because you were testing your skills against... In order to score a takedown, you had to be really clean. You had to be really good, but it helped you when you wrestled competition because you were used to guys that were very tough to score on. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a guy my Eastern, my year. This was a good analogy too. I think my junior year, I wrestled him. Um, he was a year ahead of me. He was a this senior. This is college. This is college. Okay. Uh, well, I'll start away. Let me start away. He was uh, in high school. I wrestled him uh, in freestyle mm -hmm. because he was from New York. He was a three-time New York State champion, and he was highly recruited. And uh, I was uh, just won the New Jersey States as a junior. Mm -hmm. So we wrestled a dual meet, the New York All-Stars versus New Jersey All-Stars. Mm -hmm. And he was incredibly tough defensively. He had ways to stop guys from scoring that were really good. And his name was Iacovelli, and uh, I wrestled him in a dual meet in the summer. We had a dual meet with New York and, and New Jersey, and he beat me. Uh, I think it was 7-4. And it was interesting because I might, maybe that was out at the Junior National. He beat me, I think, more, maybe 6-1 to one or 6-2 to two mm -hmm. in the first dual meet. Then I hit him out at the Junior Nationals, and he bumped me out of there. I, he beat me again. Similar mm -hmm. score. He ended up placing third at that high school nationals. Yeah. So then he goes on to Syracuse. I come back another year in high school. And then I wrestle at Lehigh. He's at Syracuse. And I don't get to the Easterns until my third third or fourth year. Mm -hmm. Okay. I had a redshirt year in there. But I freshman year, I got hurt right before Easterns. Steve Bastianelli beat me out of the spot when I was at 26 my sophomore year. So then my third year of eligibility, I'm at 134, and Daryl's redshirting that year. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm at 134, and uh, I go to Easterns, and I, uh, we actually wrestle Syracuse in a dual meet. And guess who I hit? Mark Iacovelli, mm -hmm. same New York State champ that I had and, uh, when I it was in high school. I hit him in the duel. I beat him 7-4. I wrestle him in the Eastern Finals. I beat him again, seven to four. And, uh, and how'd that feel? Huh? How'd that feel? Felt great. Here was a guy, three-time New York State champ. He beat me both times in high school. Four years later, I meet him in the Easterns. And part of it is I got a room that's the best in the country. Mm -hmm. So I was, you know, I was ready for the top guys. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was still pretty tough. And I, I'll never forget he. I thought it was kind of neat because he was cocky. They were Syracuse kind of, they were, I don't know, uh, a bunch of other guys I knew that went there. They were like, they seemed like they were real cocky. I remember I beat him in the dual meet. And mm -hmm. I, for, I, I forget who he said to, but my teammate told me, he said, Iacobelli came up and told me, he goes, I'm going to kick his butt in the Easterns. And I met him again at the Eastern Finals and I beat him. Mm -hmm. Same thing. So it was neat. Yeah. And part of it was, I was working out with Burley all the time as well as all these graduate assistants, and uh, he wasn't that tough. And so you didn't even get your spot until? At Easterns. At until, Easterns. Until junior year. Yep. I had redshirt year until the fourth year. I never got to the Easterns. Even so, though I was a varsity wrestler for two years before that, but one, I got hurt, and then at Bastionale, you beat me out at the, at the Easterns. So what was the year that you got 
all American. Like that you my were last there. year, my fifth year. And you placed third. Yeah. So how you like what did you never make it to nationals or like how many? I times? did my junior year. I made it, but I and I lost. That was frustrating too because the guy that won it, I had beaten. Mm -hmm. A guy named C D Mock from North Carolina. Mm -hmm. I'd beaten him that year, so I was in the thick of it, but yeah. I didn't. I didn't do it at nationals. You got to do it at nationals. Right. I think I was three and two, I, so I, I, I was a match from placing. Mm -hmm. You know, I had I had some wins, but as a match from play, you gotta you gotta be on every match at mm -hmm. nationals. What was then? So coming out of that, uh, how did those experiences? Uh, shape like going into like the World Cup and like I still don't completely understand the World Cup but like, like that I I'd, I'd have probably stayed wrestling. The only reason I stayed, one of the reasons I stayed with it was I didn't know what I was going to do when I got out of college. I was working. I worked for a guy, uh, Freeman Houses, Mike Frick, who was a national champ. Mm -hmm. I worked for him, and I also worked for. Um, I barely squeaked by out of Lehigh, and I worked. I didn't. I, I probably went the wrong direction in terms of. Um, but I worked for a roofing company uh, that I worked for in the summers mm -hmm. in Bethlehem. And here I was a Lehigh grad and everything, and they're like, what are you doing being a roofer here? This is crazy. And, uh, well, it was money. I was making money, but I, but I also, in addition to that, I was uh, staying involved with wrestling. Mm -hmm. I worked out. I, I, Lehigh, I'd go up to the Lehigh practices. They'd let me in their room. And then I was also competing for the New York Athletic Club and, and got a chance to wrestle in a bunch of tournaments. Um, and especially I did it when I got my first coaching job, which was 85, 86, I think. 84, 85, let me try to think. Um, and where was that? 84, 85, when I was at JMU. Okay, JMU. And I was a graduate assistant or assistant coach there. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they didn't really have I didn't make much money doing that um, but I was coaching there yeah and uh, and then since I was coaching there I, I got you know what I'm young I can I can still I'm still working out with guys that's when I did compete a lot of times um, like for instance 80, 80 I'm trying to think 83 I graduated 84 85 85 86 that's when I wrestled on the World Cup in 85 and that's when I first started coaching at JMU, mm -hmm. and then 86, 87 was my last year at JMU. After that year, we had our first All-American at, at JMU, and I was a head coach. Mm -hmm. And uh, Navy's like, hey, this guy coached the first All-American at JMU. And uh, so they hired me as an assistant coach. So you I went from still, being an assistant head coach at uh, JMU, yep. became a head coach what year? The next year at JMU. Already? Yeah. How did how'd that happen? The guy who was the head coach went um, to be an AD at uh, Clarion. Okay. And it was not well funded. Cause I feel like so the AD came to me and he goes, you want to be the head coach? <laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> and I said, what's your pay? And he goes, same as your grad assistantship. <laughs> It wasn't, it wasn't, you know. I feel I, like people these days, like, it's like, you take a while to get to. Yeah, church. but this was a, this was like a. So how was that? It was a part-time job. It was a part-time job, even though it was a head coaching job. And then when I got to Navy, it became a full-time gig. Mm -hmm. I could make a living at it. Well, how much did you learn at that, uh, being the head coach? Or the it was good. We had a good year. We had our first All-American. And again, that, that, opened having that up. first All-American. Opened up. Gave me the opportunity. Navy was like, hey, he had an All-American at JMU. Mm -hmm. He was a tough wrestler. I wrestled against Navy in Lehigh, so they knew me. And the guy that really helped me was like, not the head coach. Was the guy that oversaw the physical education department. Mm -hmm. He was the previous head coach at Navy. And he told the, the, the old assistant who became the head coach, he goes, go hire Sky. He was real good. Remember him wrestling against us? He'd be a good guy to have as an assistant. Mm -hmm. So he hired me, mm -hmm. and then I taught. Um, and so did that, once you started going there, is that what opened up Singapore and all of that, or is that not until? No, that was later in Singapore. Okay. So talk about Navy, like what was the whole experience at Navy? That was good, yeah. I was teaching phys ed, and, and uh, the guy I worked ed? for was a hard guy to work for. You were teaching phys ed? I was. 
Like I was a, a professor. I what? was an assistant professor in the physical education. How did department. I not know this? <laughs> no, <laughs> that's what I did. That's what I did. I taught wrestling, judo, and hand-to-hand -hand combat. Okay, I knew that. And in so addition to that, I also taught. I took a course in it. They they paid for me to go down. Where did I go? Up to? Might have been. Where I'm trying to think where I went to it. I think it was up. In New England. You were a professor at Navy. Yeah, well, yeah, an assistant professor. That's crazy. And uh, they said, we want to start a kayaking course. And they said, do you want to do it? And I'm like, I was the lead instructor for the kayaking course. And I went up and took a kayaking course with this guy up in Maine? I forget what it was. It was, it was up in New England. And... Uh, he taught me how to all the all the paddle strokes. Mm -hmm. uh, he taught me uh, all the basics of, of basic kayaking, and he taught me how to do an Eskimo roll. And I was the only one that could do an Eskimo roll, so I was the lead instructor. Mm -hmm. I took the course, but I taught kayaking. And, uh, I think I knew like some of this stuff, but I never yeah. realized and that. So that was, was at Navy. that was that was all at Navy, and so that was fun. So and, uh, judo, um, judo, we I was a real advantage because. The old judo course, they kind of just did a hodgepodge of judo that they didn't have the right names. They didn't, they kind of faked it with the different throws. They didn't really teach them the right way. Mm -hmm. And then we, then Navy so, had a guy from, uh, the Naval Academy had a guy that wrestled at Missouri, okay, mm -hmm. whose brother I wrestled in the NCAA uh, Constellation Finals. I yeah. wrestled him in the All Star match. His name was Wayland. Okay. And his family, his dad was a judo, black belt judo guy. So they were all black belt judo guys. Did the wrestlers so he, take all these courses then? Well, no. The, what happened is he he came as an assistant professor, or as a as an instructor as well. Mm -hmm. But he was an officer in the in the navy. Mm -hmm. So they used him to come in and and he taught the basic judo course. And that's I he said, look, I'm going to teach it exactly how it should be taught as a white belt level mm -hmm. and just follow everything I do and that's exactly what we did and it was a completely new judo course and it was much more appreciated by the midshipmen uh, it was an actual following the, the judo protocol that was using all the names and the correct throws and, the head dude and, and he was the head and I followed exactly what he did and eventually I taught it exactly as he did when I had my own courses mm -hmm. and it had a, a name for everything it was a basic hip throw, which was Ogoshi, and then there was uh, uh, a hip, uh, a, sh uh, a different kind of hip throw called uh, Sode Surikomi Goshi, and then there was uh, Surikomi Goshi, which was um, grabbing the back of the gi and the, and the sleeve, and, and again, hip throwing, and then the Sode Surikomi Goshi was the sleeves, where you turn the sleeves like this and you did a hip throw, and then they had Ipon Sewe Nage, which was the single arm throw, and then Marote Sewe Nage was a double arm throw, and then there were four hold downs, uh, uh, Kata Katame, Kesa Katame, uh, Yoko Shiho Katame, and what was the fourth one? But they were all hold downs, and then they had three different chokes, back choke with the, with the gi, and then a front choke. And, 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 the, and we taught all this. And when's the last time like you did any of that? Like, because I think it's crazy that you remember all that. If like I don't know, you, well, you taught it for a long time, for ten years. When you, so you knew all the names, and it was it was fun, kind of learning that new way to teach it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he was a real help to establishing the 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 curriculum for this judo course. Because mm -hmm. before that, they were like, well, this is kind of a leg hip throw, which <laughs> yeah. really wasn't a technical. Whereas he did it exactly the way it's done yeah. in, in, in judo mm -hmm. and because he was a black belt. And so that was a real uh, neat experience. And uh, Did you ever dive into judo at all? No, but I, I, I knew how to teach it. And what it also did is the other guys that were teaching it, they didn't know what the hell they were doing. So they were lead instructors and I was one of them because mm -hmm. I was with this guy. But there were other guys that came in, lacrosse coaches taught with us. Mm -hmm. and they didn't know what the hell they were doing yeah. and it wasn't that they they didn't hire them as judo instructors they hired mm -hmm. them as lacrosse coaches mm -hmm. so they would kind of they eventually kind of got a little bit better at it but
we were in the wrestling room and I was with this guy every day because yeah. he was teaching wrestling as well. So if I ever had questions, he'd show me. Yeah. So it was good. And then I got to know his family and then I, I re reacquainted with his brother. So now to this day, he's on my Facebook. We're good buddies and yeah, that's he, cool. was, he was a neat guy. Um, and so like the other two, so you did judo and what were the other classes? Hand to hand combat. And what was the other one? And the other one was uh, wrestling. Okay, so you just... The midshipmen had to learn just, wrestling, judo, and then the basic hand-to-hand -hand combat. You know what the midshipmen called that course? What? Hand-to-gland. Yeah? What the... Because you're always kicking a guy in the groin, or you're going down and you hit him in the groin, or you elbow him in the groin, so it was always hand-to-gland. So what was that like? Like, cause I that always was, wanted to learn like defensive, like just that was that like, was basic stuff. Um, I obviously never used it, uh, um, but it was identifying the areas of the body that you're protecting, as well as the area of the body that you're <coughs> attacking, and uh, you're not making a, a, a you're not making the people being great boxers, but you're teaching them how to protect your head and your neck area, mm -hmm. how to throw a punch, but we're not really teaching them how to box. Mm -hmm. We're, for the most part, it was flipper kick, side kick to the knee. So we're not even bringing a, a kick up to the face because mm -hmm. most of these kicks are done by people that don't have great flexibility that aren't necessarily, you know, um, guys that are, are familiar with that. Mm -hmm. But you know how to strike, where to, where to strike to the nose, to the neck, mm -hmm. um, you know, and then uh, being able to, um, what else did we do? We did um, uh, joint locks. Mm -hmm. We did um, um, eye gal, you know, yeah, hit him in the eye. eye. Well, yeah, a guy's coming up, boom, hit, hit him in the eye and get out of there. Or, you know, we're teaching basic, you take, like, like it, basic stuff that, or... that we're, you know, if someone's attacking you. What, what to you do? Did you defend, what to do? Like guns or like knives? Or they had a gun and knife, but it was kind of goofy, but. They had wooden knives and had to defend against the knife. All right, so like, what are you gonna do? Like, when I have it, a gun. I'm gonna attack the gun. I'm gonna attack the gun. You know, okay. but I'm not. You're gonna get like, first thing I with a gun. With a gun, a, a gun. You the always is gonna be here in my class ring. Here's my wallet. You can get out of there. You know, oh, but you feel like that nice. guy's gonna shoot. Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna get the, get your wallet and you're gonna grab the gun and then you're gonna side kick to the knee. Mm -hmm. You know, and put it down. And the uh, knife, the knife is going to be, no, uh, well, if they're coming at you that way, first of all, you teach them how to use it. <laughs> well, uh, good, the good, the good, the good, good guy with the knife, yeah, going to be there. So as he goes to stab, I'm going to grab the wrist and I'm going to circle down. Come here, I'll show you. Yeah. He stabs you with the knife, I'm going to grab, and then I'm going to circle down. I'm going to, as I... I, I don't know, we don't have room here. I'm going to circle that down. I'm going to kick to the knee. Yeah. I'm going to kick to the groin. I'm going to pull that all the way down to the ground. I'm going to uh -huh. get down to the ground. I'm going to kneel on that and uh, disarm him. Uh, Take the uh, knife away. <laughs> you can watch this. You want my watch here? There it is. But if you, if you feel like that guy's going to shoot, you're going to be like, no, please don't shoot. Please don't shoot. Go mm -hmm. ahead. Put your gun on. Put your gun on. Don't shoot that down and again same thing down pull it out go against the wrist pull it up against this way mm -hmm. we had little wooden how guns. many years was that the years i was there i guess it was about 10 years really 10 or 11 like, years so 10 years of teaching that yeah that's crazy i didn't know that um so then after where like how did you how did you where did you go after navy what did I do right after Navy? I went and worked for uh, Penna Caramel. And at that point, you were together with Mom, right? Yes, I had already married Mom. Okay, so then you're... I met you her. Had, you had Sarah and you had Cortland. Yes. And then, was it just going straight to F&M then? No, I went to Penna Caramel. What's that? I went and worked. For, I didn't have a job. Is that a college? I left Navy. It? They wanted a different guy. Reg wanted a different guy. And... Which is sometimes that happens, mm -hmm. and uh, so I didn't have a coaching job. Okay. So I I, so I, I called for... around to a bunch of people. I called my coach at Lehigh. He recommended I talk to a guy that was his 
teammate mm -hmm. who was a very wealthy guy and lived up in the Philadelphia area, Bryn Avon. Mm -hmm. And he had a guy that started his own company. Um, uh, who are you looking at? Newsbrook. Keep going. Huh? Keep going. Um, oh, uh, so um, this guy's name was Mark uh, Aramore. Okay. And uh, he and his buddy Mark Penick started this landscaping outfit. And uh, it, it had grown a lot. Mm -hmm. They called it Penick Aramore. And so I worked for them for two years. Okay. And they put me up in New Jersey after I learned how to, what they were doing. They, I started a, a, a branch of their company up in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did that for a little bit, but I, I was like, I, I don't really want to do this for my whole life. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's when F&M came open. And I put my name in a hat. And how did you? How did that? Like, how did you figure out that they were looking for it? Well, I knew they, they they advertised they were looking for a new head coach, and their guy was left. And so and you just I, like interview in there, and you got the job. I went there. I got the job. Yeah. Okay. And then so like. So we moved here. And then and now is this house right? So we just mm -hmm. moved here, and then what were your experiences being the head coach there? Like, it was hard because they didn't have any scholarships. It, very very expensive school mm -hmm. they didn't have much uh, financial aid compared to the Ivies um, so it was a tough place to recruit to mm -hmm. and uh, do they still we have scholarships they no uh, I'm not sure if they do or not if they're given money in some other way I'm not sure but I know what they do it because they're D1 yeah but they don't they're that college just didn't they didn't have a scholarship they Are had they financial D3? aid are they a D3 college with a D1 wrestling? Yes, that's so exactly that's why. right. Yeah, and, okay. and uh, so I don't know how they're, how they're using it now, but mm. it was difficult. And we had some good kids that, w that went there, but um, we weren't, we were at the basement of the EIWA conference and they're kind of similar. And from what I understand, Long Island uh, University that's in there now, it may be, they're battling with them for the, not to be the, the the basement of the EIWA, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And then, so when did you end up going to Singapore for? Well, in that part, I. Uh, and how did that like tell me all about that? Like, how did that even like come about? They had an uh, there was an opportunity. Um, uh, I forget who connected me with it. I think Tom Hutchinson, who was the assistant coach at Lehigh. Um, there was an opportunity to start a wrestling program in Singapore. And um, who was it? I guess Coach Turner talked about, and Tom Hutchinson was gonna go over there with Sergey, who was gonna be the uh, technician, mm -hmm. but Hutchinson was gonna be there to, as well. And uh, there was this wealthy guy in Singapore that wanted to start a wrestling program that was a former not even sure if he was a wrestler. He was, but he, he was really liked wrestling, and he wanted to try to grow the sport in Singapore. So mm -hmm. he he connected with uh, I forget it was I even forget about the guy who might have been uh, Kirk Pendleton. Who should I connect with? And he he said, well, connect with Thad Turner or Tom Hutchinson, mm -hmm. which were Lehigh guys, and then. They were going to hire Tom Hutchinson along with Sergey, who was one of the best clinicians in the world, you know, two-time Olympic and multiple world champion. Mm -hmm. And Sergey would teach the technique, but then Hutchinson and I would help uh, write a curriculum and write down technique that Sergey had done and help teach it. Mm -hmm. And so Hutch grabbed me, and I was still I was coaching. I was, you know, and so it was a an opportunity that was just because I was involved with the coach and already, he's like, well, here's a college coach. And so I went over there for the summer with them and that worked out really, really well. You know, that, mm -hmm. uh, um, was that set? Cause what was the thing that you had to recruit people to F and M and you were, you went, so I thought, it. Was, oh, I went to another country. Yeah. Yeah. I probably, mm -hmm. that probably was the beginning of the end for me. Yeah. I don't know, it was a stupid idea, I guess. And and but, but I'm like, well, yeah, maybe it'll work. <laughs> where was that? And how did that, how did that uh, Well F and M had a strong international um, um 
interest. Mm -hmm. Like they had a lot of people from different countries. Like they had a number of uh, squash players from yeah. Pakistan and India. I think it looks good on their and college. Yeah, like. well, yeah, and for what for whatever reason they they liked that they were uh, well rounded and they had all kinds of international students. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know why I thought this, but I said. Uh, you know, what about Iran? They have a real good wrestling program for a little country. Now, of course, they also had, you know, captured people. I don't know if you remember when they had the hostage, they, they uh, what was it? The, uh, um, they had people locked up over there for uh, a period of time. What was the, uh, and of course, so they were not yeah. <laughs> on the list of, you know, uh, but anyway, I thought, oh, okay, this will open up a door, you know. But they let it, at, like, if they, because they, you went there. I went over to Iran. They paid for my flight over there. Mm -hmm. And I knew a guy at the New York AC. His name was Hamid Kerman Shah, mm -hmm. who was an Iranian. He go, I, I called him up. I said, you think I could get, recruit some guys? He goes, oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> so I went over there and I did, there were two two guys that, that were, one was the son of a coach, the national coach. Mm -hmm. And of course, I came back, and I, and F and M was like, "This is idiotic. We're not doing this." You're, and and, and so they couldn't do it because well, they, they they didn't. We didn't really have tremendous uh, exact applicants that were going to fit. Um, but initially, they were open to the idea of maybe having some students from the Islamic Republic of Iran. And of course, I was thinking we were going to get good wrestlers, but they were so far distant from what. They were used to, I think, many of the international students they had were from wealthy families that had went to private schools and were very, very broad. Oh, and so they just didn't and have the they money. Didn't, we didn't, the they, money there too. weren't people like that in Iran, you know. And so whatever I thought went out the window. You know, they paid for me to go over there, and they're like, yeah, we're not, <laughs> we're not recruiting any of them. So that was kind of but the beginning of the end. they pay for that? If they well, I don't know. Maybe I was, sell, I was selling a... You know, something to one guy, and he was like, "Yeah, go ahead, whatever he's saying, let's give it a try." And then when I came back, they're like, "Nah, this is a dumb idea." You know, this we're not doing this. Mm -hmm. So it was probably not as well thought out as I thought. But, so then yeah. after that, because I know you talked to Luther about this and uh, about the FBI, like you being an FBI, and I didn't even know that you were like at one point you were trying. Oh to no, that. that was way back. A so while where, ago. when, was that? Was that like, I talked to Luther about that, or you did? You did. I talked to Luther about applying for the FBI. Yeah, but like, anyways, wait, how did that even like? Oh, I that was I right out of that was right out of college. I okay. wasn't sure what I was going to do, and so I applied to a couple of different places. I applied to you, like, DEA. A I applied to uh, um, uh, where else? Uh, it was on the list for the New New Jersey State Police. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I was. I thought it'd be exciting. I was going to law enforcement. Like, or like, how did that FBI, happen? DEA. FBI, you had to wait three years, so I never really put my hooks into an FBI application because by that time, I had changed directions anyway. But I, DEA, I applied for. Uh, New Jersey State Police, I applied for. Mm -hmm. Who else? Um, uh, DEA, uh, um, New Jersey State Police. Trying to think who else. What other and are you just like able to get into these? Because like nowadays you have to have degrees and all this, and you have to have like. So well, they much they had things so that, that you could. could that, yeah, you didn't have to have a. But for the New Jersey State Police, you didn't need a a, a, um, a degree with what is it criminal criminal yeah, science criminal or whatever. Justice. Yeah, criminal. You didn't need that. You know, and I was going to do that. I was on the list mm. for the New Jersey State Police, but by the time that would have rolled around, I had already decided. You know, to hell with that. I'm gonna. F and M, they're gonna hire me, and I'll be a wrestling coach, a grad assistant wrestling coach. Well, so ultimately, what do you think are like the biggest lessons you learned from wrestling? Like, uh, wrestling I think that you got persistence pays off, and that uh, you just hard work uh, is is key. But I also, I, I did not, I wasn't really uh, sharp in terms of finding, you know, uh, like I wasn't thinking of things as what's the best long term to put me in a position where I'll be able to retire, have a good source of income for raising a family and this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I was like, 
what's going to fire me up? Which job is going to be exciting and mm -hmm. very satisfying that I think I'd love to do? Instead of how do I make good money and mm -hmm. do something that I, I wouldn't mind doing? But I was like, what do you think I'd like to do? And that's where I thought initially, yeah, law enforcement, that'd be fun. I could do that. That would be exciting. And then, and then I was like, ah, oh, wrestling. And I, I liked teaching wrestling. I liked being involved with wrestling. Obviously, I was had done it all through college and in even a few years beyond. Mm -hmm. So I was like, yeah, that'd be that'd be motivating. Probably what I should have done in hindsight that would have put me in a better position to where I am, uh, getting ready to retire in my mid sixties would be to go and be a public school teacher. And I toyed with that idea. I applied a couple places, but then I got an opportunity at JMU, and then JMU. But the other thing, I mean, I you wouldn't be here. He wouldn't be here. You might have been John Boy with someone else, and I. Would have, he might have been Rachel with some, or or Betty or whoever. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I met Mom because she got a job at Navy, and I got a job at Navy. Mm -hmm. Coaching, I mean, coaching wrestling. I think you could still, even today, uh, like I think it was like all the experiences that you had in wrestling, you could still make a job out of it, essentially. That's what I want to do, at least. I want to make like an online business and have wrestling. And I want you to be a part of it. And you yeah, can, sure. Like, I'll and, make it especially good. with the judo experience, too. And then you can just, you can essentially just like that you can do that as your career you can have judo you can have whatever classes you can have the hand-to-hand -hand combat classes you can right. have all, all the stuff you already know yeah that's, like, that's that I, I could do that yeah and that's what i think like but that's what i think uh, like that's where i'm kind of currently looking because i'm still okay. i'm at that i didn't mind that i like that that was fun <clears throat> I, teaching at navy that was now that's already when i i was there from when was I there from like, did you ever 87 think to 96? How many years ago was that? My last year there was for, what are we, 23? 27 years ago. Mm -hmm. So that was a long time ago. I'm, I'm an old geezer, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I don't know if that people are going to be like, does this guy need a cane to get first to get to get out here on the mat? With you can still teach technique. You can oh, have yeah, two no, people. Yeah, yeah. I know no, that's, doing. Well, that's true. It's not that. Yeah. Uh, but um, just like in that moment, like you could have, like I feel like that's kind of what I want to do. It's like I mean, after college, like I mean, I have a little bit of the background of like exercise science, so that's gonna be cool. Yeah. But uh, I, I like I kind of want to go into martial arts. You do? Okay. Well, there's here, the one thing that was that I did do mm -hmm. was think about how much money can I make doing this. I was like, they're gonna pay me some money to do something I really enjoy. That's easy. I'll do it. Mm -hmm. Not like many of the guys that I knew at Lehigh. How do I get rich? I get rich by doing this mm -hmm. for 20 years. And now those guys that I know that were teammates of mine are retired and have a vacation home or regular home and I didn't <laughs> look at it that way mm -hmm. but that's okay yeah. all right well, I wouldn't have ever gotten to know Brooke yeah. if that was it I and I wouldn't have known a Braden and how they were going to be connected together so uh, maybe everything worked out exactly as it should have right there we go yeah well i appreciate you being on my first episode of my podcast you got it. thank you, you got father it. Right. uh and thank you if you guys are still watching uh uh be sure to like and subscribe check out uh other videos on this channel uh and thank you all right thank you father all right that was a good one